Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, here it is, Palm Sunday. And look at it. There's our new palm tree. The last one we had, I think, lasted for three years. And I think when we shut down uh, for those periods of time, the poor thing went to heaven. Which was a real oversight because, you know, we're pretty good at things like that, looking after the plants. And as you can see, our beautiful garden, it's a, it's a monastery garden, really, when you look at it. I walked around it this morning because we had that extra hour. Wasn't it great? Oh, I hope it doesn't wear off too quickly, but it was just so good to be able to have that extra time. Everyone's not a car on the road. It's wonderful. Now, there is our partner. Lorraine, thank you for our new palm tree. Yes. I'll show it to you on the screen in a minute. We've got a few people there. Um, but Beverly, would you like to come up and tell us a little bit about palm trees? We've done some deep, heavy research. Beverly <laughs> 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 will be interested in palm trees. Yes. Yeah. Hello, everyone on Zoom. Good morning. Good morning to everyone here. Well, I did a little bit of research. Let's not go overboard, Reverend Bear. Uh, it, of course, is considered biblical. That's the first thing uh, to be told about it. The palm tree is a symbol of life, and the Assyrians believed that the, the ultimate symbol of eternal life was a tree growing beside a stream, and the tree they valued most was the palm tree. Palm trees can be skyscrapers. Some palms can grow to over 80 feet tall, and the tallest species of all is the Quindio wax palm, which can grow from 160 to 200 feet. It's the national emblem of Colombia and is now a protected species, which means it can't be used for logging. Franciscan missionaries are credited with being the first to plant palm trees in California, and that's for ornamental purposes. And they did that in the 18th century. Since then, they've become an icon of the region, along with the Hollywood sign. The Mexican fan palm, which is known as Washingtonia robusta, which I thought was interesting, which grows in the Los Angeles areas, grows up to about 98 feet. And the date palm, which is a fast grower, can reach about 80 feet. Some palm trees can last a century or longer. And this means if you plant a palm tree, it may outlive you. When watering a palm tree, it's important to water not only the roots, but the individual leaves or fronds. And that's beneficial as it washes away dust and insects that like to hide out in the long stems of some palms. Young palms are shade lovers. They should be planted under the canopy of other trees, which then protect them. This was interesting, I thought. Trimming palm trees can be a dangerous job and should only be done by expert tree trimmers. Deaths have occurred when inexperienced tree cutters have been suffocated by fronds that have fallen on the worker. The fronds are extremely heavy in many cases and can fall, putting hundreds of pounds of pressure on the tree cutters. Finally, some palm trees produce edible fruit, such as the coconut palm and the date palm. But there are others, such as the sago palm, and they're poisonous to humans and animals. So it's interesting, isn't it? What we didn't know, I certainly didn't know. And 200 feet tall. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> For me, there's always something romantic about a palm tree. I bought my first little house about 20 years ago, and I think having that palm tree on it was one of the things which I value, and I think it will outlast me, and uh, it's in good health. And when I went to the States, of course, we see all the different ones. When I went to um, Arizona, the big tall trees, and also Hollywood Boulevard, uh, they certainly have a presence. So welcome to Palm Sunday. Now, in many traditional Christian churches, this will be the story of Jesus entering into Jerusalem uh, with the people who heard so much about him, uh, waving palm trees and singing hosannas. 
Now, I've got a little bit here which I may deviate from. Now, why would the people bother to come out and see Jesus? He didn't start a new religion. All he did was bring to life what they already had in the temples and synagogues and brought it into the, a new perspective, which didn't go down too well with the majority of the hierarchy, as you can imagine. He used the existing teachings and brought them to life so that we could have a better life. And he also taught something which was quite outrageous at the time, that you didn't need to go through a priest or a minister. You could have your own personal relationship with that inner Christ. And we know that Christ wasn't the last name of Jesus. It was a title. And it's the highest state we can get here. And as we approach this Holy Week, we come into some of the stories and we look at them from a metaphysical point of view. And we can see what Jesus went through as a person, we go through. Now, it's not just Holy Week, and there's another place in the Bible where it says, don't you know that you're standing on holy ground? Every speck of the planet is on the ground and every day and every week is holy week if you want to look at it that way on your way to expanding consciousness now in the bible story it was three years before palm sunday that jesus started his mission as christ and what a bumpy road it was first of all we read of him being uh, initiated and blessed by john the baptist and in metaphysical teachings, John the Baptist represents the intellect. How many books have we read? How many teachers have we been to? How many seminars have we done? And how many of these things online do we look at? That's great, but we always seem to find that we go to another one and another one. And I look back at some of the situations I've been in, the groups I've been in, and I thought, well, for goodness sakes, there comes a time when you have to stop that. You've got the information, you've got the intellectual reasons why we have the Christ in us, but then comes the hard part. Oh, it's also got its blessings. So after being initiated by John the Baptist, up the mountain he goes to a desert place, and there he realises the power he's got. And don't we all do that sometimes when we have a bit of power over something? How do we use it? Do we use it ethically and fairly? He was tempted, and they used the term the devil. Let's the ego out of control. He was tempted to do many, many things. But he said that famous saying, get thee behind me, Satan. And I believe that it wouldn't have just been a little statement like that. You'd have to yell and scream and make a stand. And the other thing that goes with that is Pharaoh. We read about Pharaoh when Moses comes in to say, let my people go. Pharaoh, as we know from uh, a month or so back, represents the solar plexus. And that is where everything that happens takes its own life. We command it by our Higher self, not higher self, the conscious mind has to control the subconscious. But we know many times those old things we've programmed in here are churning away. And how many times have we had to say, get out? Moses had to uh, get, get into Pharaoh. Moses represents fresh ideas, new ideas. Pharaoh didn't want to hear them. And the Kahunas say, when the subconscious accepts something, then it can ascend to the higher self and miracles can happen. But they knew all this before the missionaries came a couple of hundred years ago to Hawaii. And a lot of indigenous people and friends of mine, we can learn from them. Look at how we're learning about the earth. I think most of us here knew that anyway. We all always treat the earth with respect but it's becoming more and more mainstream that we have to look after this pristine planet where every step is a holy ground step. 
Now, Jesus came down from the mountain that time, but that wasn't the Hosanna time. He came down. He went up there, by the way, and came down on the donkey, and the donkey represents our animal nature or our ego. Now, we don't want to kill our ego. We need an ego in this planet, for goodness sakes. We need it to survive, but we have to control it. We have to be in control of our ego, not let it control us. And isn't that a big one for people today? I, when people go into politics, I think they're very brave because usually they come out pretty scarred. And, but someone's got to do it. And what they learn from that must be amazing in their own lives when they get to the point where they sit down quietly after their career and think about what happened. Anyway, three years go by, and Jesus is doing his miracles, and he's speaking to the average person. So when he's speaking to them, he doesn't want anything from them. He's giving them this particular truth. And one of the teachings, the biggest teaching, is the universal God. In John 13, verse 34 to 35, love one another as I have loved you. And it's interesting, the power of the month, for this month, April, is love. The disciple is John, and the colour is pink. The qualities of love are used to unify and harmonise and attract. Now, if you think it's all lovey-dovey with love, we've got another idea coming. You've all heard the expression tough love. Um, and when I was in a seminar in the States, this woman called, didn't even know about tough love. She said that's love on steroids. But call it what you want. Sometimes it needs to happen. To love ourselves, we have to say no to this. And we're loving ourselves by doing that. We're all so used to the romantic idea of it. So from the book, Keep a True Lent by Charles Fulmore, love in divine mind is the idea of universal unity. In expression, it is the power that binds and joins together the universe and ever the world. Love is a harmonious and constructive power. Last week was Harmony Week. And in this week, Holy Week, we can continue to focus on love and harmony. Not easy. We live in a world of opposites. Up, down, hot, cold, love, and the opposite of love. And we can use this golden rule to help us. I don't think we'll ever be perfect on this planet. As long as we can just keep an even keel, I think we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Because this planet is a school. A school for students to learn how to love one another. And we're not all at the same spot, in the same place at the right time with our consciousness. And that's what makes us, those that have had a glimpse of this truth, to put it into action and demonstrate it as best we can. And look at the mayhem it caused in Jesus' life, because he live by that truth and cost him his life in the end. When Jesus was teaching, what did the people want from him? They just wanted to hear what he had to say. It was so simple. In the old Jewish tradition in the temple, it was the letter of the law, the old Ten Commandments. How severe were they? But Jesus broke through that and taught them the Beatitudes. Blessed are ye who do this and that. There's none of them, but that's another story. And if you want to look them up, they're there. He taught that we don't need another person. But mind you, I think we do need our teachers as we go on. But don't let's get attached to it. So the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And when Jesus was preaching, uh, he fed 5,000 people, so it says. Now, there may be many metaphysical terms for that, but he didn't say, um, if you want to have food, 
Uh, you've got to stay and listen to me speak. He just gave the food. And I relate that with the taxi driver in Ballarat when I went to pick up my car the other day. He had the turban, I've not mentioned this, but it just struck me. And I said, is this the last one for the day? He said, yes, I'm off to the kitchen and we're making some meals for the people of Ballarat. And he said, we don't want anything from them. We're not preaching religion. We just are going to give them the food. And if we don't have our basic needs met, we are not interested in any of this stuff. It's pure survival. And how many people are living like that? I'm driving through Delico, which is a brand new suburb, all these mansions. And it was five, 10 years ago, there was nothing there. And I think here they are building these houses here and bombing them in the rest of the world. What mayhem? And I count my blessings that, you know, I live here and I'm going to take advantage of all that this offers while we're going through this particular period of time. Jesus taught them to look at things another way. Do unto others the law of attraction. He taught them, really, mind power. It be called magic. The people in charge of the temples didn't want that. They had control of people. Powerful control. And it still is in there today. Looking back over history, uh, something in the American politics, one cardinal said to this politician, if you do this, 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 I'll guarantee you five million votes from the congregation. Whether that was true or false, but I somehow it rang true. We are so easily influenced. And look at how now, even, Certain groups say, vote for this, vote for that. Never thought I'd have to see the day, but here we are. And what a challenge for us as we go through this transformation. Okay, so this is it. We can go around the world looking for temples and special spiritual places, but we are it. My dear Yogananda, who I know Leslie is fond of, and some of you here have read the works of Yogananda, he says our body, in this physical form, and I love this saying, it's the secret door to divinity. In our body is the secret door to divinity. And we can hasten that evolution by a proper diet, healthy living and reverence for our body as the temple of God. Well, as I said in the world of opposites, sometimes we feel good and we say, yep, okay, I'm going to live healthily. Other times we just think, oh, I can't be bothered. It's been a long day. Why are we so caught up in these things? I have stopped watching the news on this thing. The headlines are absolutely ridiculous and I don't even think about it. I might get the paper because it's got my favourite crossword. But that's about it. Of course, I watch the pan football. And if there's any great dramatic something or other there, I take notice of it, but I try not to let it interfere with my day. So it's not easy to live that way all the time. But we be kind with ourselves and just know that we can only do, as we talked about in four agreements, we can do the best we can. And that will change according to how we feel. Some days our best may not be brilliant best, but we've showed up and we've done the job. We're born perfect, as we know, but we're all still learning how to express more and more of that perfection, regardless of appearances of the outside. And there comes times when we, in our meditation, we do reach that point of peace. Now, I wanted to look up that verse John 14, verse 20. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So we know we're going to have our moments, but there comes a time when it's really vital for us to plan our spiritual path, 
spend some time in meditation. And the Hopo Ono prayer is great. If something negative comes into your mind, I like to say that 10 times. And unfortunately, I thinking that enlightenment, we get more and more of that. As we look back, we think, my goodness, was did I do that? How stupid was I? And we don't have to be in a spiritual group for that to happen. It happens because we get older. Some get that earlier, some get it later, but there comes a time when we're confronted with things. So it's best to get it over and done with now. We don't have to wait till we drop off the planet. We can get a lot done here and now. Now, it's... An interesting time this week, I know time's running out, but to sum up, during the week of Easter, this last week, we have some simple but iconic, uh, little iconic, what would you call, images that have stayed with us in the Christian movement. We know the palm trees there, and we know that things like the cross, wine, and also bread, the breaking of bread, and there are other things too. And it's quite possible that we can do a, a communion here if we know the metaphysical way of doing it. So I'd like you, if you could, or if you want to, look up the metaphysical Bible. If you're in this group, it's vital to have the Bible dictionary. It's a big book and also the revealing word, which is this one. It just makes sense. And I've been uh, getting ready to teach Jesus' teaching through the Unity National School. And this has come at just the right time because I'm just revising all these things. So one example only, I'm going to go through the rest of them, the cross. Now the cross is defined as the crystallization of two currents of thought. The vertical line symbolizes the cross current of divine life. That's spirit coming down. And the horizontal line represents the cross current of human limitations, our sense of mind. So here we are, where are we on, on the cross? Which, which part are we? I suppose when we're in the middle is when we reach that Christ consciousness. Another interesting thing, when Jesus, uh, just before he died on the cross, says the veils of the temple were split apart. Our body is the temple. And the veil is on us. We have to remove those veils and lo and behold, we're in the centre of that cross. So, I think I've covered enough today and I hope I've encouraged you to look up some of the things that are needed for a pleasant Easter, but also one, an Easter of reflection and an Easter of joy. And next week is Easter Sunday. And Reverend Phyllis will be here for that. And, um, you know, all the best for it. And I hope you've got something out of today's talk. Thank you. Thank you.